Good morning, Revolution Church. How you doing? All right. I've just been pacing and peeing back there like crazy because I just get so nervous every week, and I'm okay with that. And I'm really just, man, it's excitement is what it really is, that, that we get so many people that want to check us out and visit us every week. We, we, there's not a week that goes by that we don't see somebody new. And we just like to see lives change, okay? We're trying to lead people from where they are to where God wants to be. That's the motto around here. And so uh, we always have guests, but today, man, I got a friend. I don't know. I can't see you that well, so if you sleep, he, you're fine. But uh, uh, Daniel Woodard and his wife, Tara, they are my, he's my college buddy, and he's just been called into the ministry, leaving his job. Can you clap for him, just to encourage? Yeah. He's a, he's a good guy. So uh, I love that. I love hearing people take that big step, and it's hard, and it's difficult, but it's so worth it. So thanks for encouraging him. Man, we've been, we're in a series that's called Gravity, and it's uh, specifically called Gravity because, man, there's such a weight. I don't care what church you go to or, or who you run into. Man, there's, a, there's an oppressive weight that just weighs people down, man. It's like a wet blanket, and it just keeps people from doing what God calls them to do. Until they're uh, allowed to have an interaction, and sometimes that's what we do. That's the way we look at things is we do the best we can around here. That's why we've got our, our audiovisual ninjas that just take care of things. You, you don't see them much, and, and so that we can have, so you can have an environment that, man, you can come in and just hear about Jesus, man. And, and, and we know we were praying today about the hope that so many people would have for the situations in our life. So the Gravity Series has been very productive. People are, are hearing God's Word, and they're responding to it. And, man, the, the, the stories are just endless. With uh, it, Sometimes it's little bitty small things like, I mean, I quit smoking. To God coming to quit smoking and make a move on that. To my marriage, man, it's moving in the right direction finally after all these years with the end of our rope. And, man, God's doing amazing things. And it's because they're hearing and reading God's Word. Okay, so today we're in Scripture. Today it's, it's going to continue the theme. It's our last day of gravity. Okay, we still expect big things. And uh, I just, I just want to say something real quick. God always illustrates in my life uh, what He wants me to know and what He wants me to see in the direction He wants me to move. He just won't let me just read it and just, just take His word for it. He always does it. And i got to tell you, I had a scary moment at work this week. I'm a, a therapist, and I've heard just about everything you could hear at my young age, I've been at this a while, 13 years of what I do for a living, and there's nothing that shocks me anymore. Nothing shocks me. And uh, so it's not the words that people bring to me or their circumstances, but there's just one lady. Uh, she's, she looks pretty gentle. And, uh, but, man, her breath is on steroids. I mean, it is horrible. It's bad. It, it, and it makes you start dry heaving. It would gag a maggot. I can't come up with enough, enough adjectives just to say, but... I did an, uh, like an evaluation on her years ago. Nice lady, gosh. I mean, I'm telling you, my eyes were watering. I was considered pulling a fire alarm. I had to get out of there. I mean, it was literally, I was just, my, my beard was falling out. It was bad. And I saw her out in the hall, and I thought, oh, my God, she's not here to see me. I love her, but can we do teleconference or talk to her on the phone? But I thought, I feel sorry for whoever's seeing her today. It is that bad. It makes you want, listen, it makes you want to avoid her. It's that bad. I mean, uh, and this is back, remember when uh, Jesus Take the Wheel came out? That song was the same time frame. I'm sure I was in chorus of Jesus Take the Wheel because her breath is melting my face. And so this is somebody that you would, listen, avoid. It's somebody that you wouldn't come in contact with. Well, I kept my eyes open because I'm sitting in my office thinking, man, they need to come up with a cure for this. Is there like some kind of walk we can do to raise money for, for bad breath like this? I mean, it's not normal. It's not. And, and I thought, I, a lot of times I thought I was on, am I on a uh, hidden camera show or something? Somebody trying to film my reaction to this lady's breath. It is that bad. I was coming up with cures in my office of like prescription Tic Tacs. I don't know. But I just knew that, man, I didn't want to interact with this lady. Her situation was so bad, I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. I didn't want to do it. There's too much at risk, a melted face and all that. But, man, there was a lady. I paid attention to who, and she's a couple doors down, and she kind of does what I do. And, uh, man, I saw her talking to her, and even talking to her in the hall. You know, there's a bubble. Well, she, she allowed that lady to get in her bubble. I know it was killing her. I know it was. And at first I was laughing about on the inside. I was like, I'm just making jokes, remembering how bad it was. And, and after it was over, she didn't, she didn't bat an eye. I'm blinking like with every breath she's taking when, when I saw her, but this lady just stood there and just listened to her. And of course, you know, we didn't get into all that was going on with this lady. But man, I just talked to her. I said, did her breath, did her breath not just knock you out? I was going to try to make it a little funny because it's still lingering in the hallway. And she said, 
Well, you know, her, her situation was so rough that I, could, I, I saw through a problem. I mean, through a breath and saw her problem. I thought, man, how many people are actually willing to do that, to be inconvenienced? That's, you know, that's funny. The breath thing was all funny. But, man, I love it. I started thinking about Jesus and just how much when he's interrupted, what an inconvenience that it would seem to us but not to him and how available he is to us despite our mess, despite our bad breath, despite our circumstances, despite our sin. He's, he's still willing to be with us. He's so available to us. Even when we aren't available to people a lot of times, we can't be. He always is. So it kind of leads us. I hope you'll see that, that kind of illustration weaved into this, this scripture today. I think it's awesome. And uh, we're going to have it on the screen today. Um, and here's what we're going to do. First, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray real quick because we just need to this morning. Let's pray. Father God, there's situation and circumstances, Lord, that are lingering among people, Lord. They're, you know better than I do. They're coming in, Lord, with impossible situations, Lord. And today you're going to instill hope. God, you're going you're gonna, to uh, let, let them have a new perspective, Lord, that only comes from reading your word. And we're going to uh, just read your word and sing your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so here's what we're going to do today. The, the good news today is that uh, salvation is a gift. It's not a reward. And it really just boils down to whether or not you'll receive that. I know you'll hear it, but the, the, the question is, will you receive it today? It's available to you. So we're just going to start. Uh, the scripture is going to come on, up on the screen. In verse 40, this is Luke chapter 8. Luke and Mark are just chock full of these kind of situations, impossible scenarios, things where there is no hope. And, and the writers of Luke and Mark love to, to point you towards Jesus and him being that hope. Okay, we're just going to start reading. We're going to dissect it. And man, just ask God to show you something today. Okay? So now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him for they were all expecting him. Okay? Jesus has come from a situation, and we studied about this in this Gravity series, was this crazy dude. He was running around naked, cutting himself. Everybody avoided him. They isolated him. And it was a, a great picture of where we are in our sin and away from God. And when he healed this guy, he, he removed the demon within this guy. He restored him and made him new what he offers us. And the people that were around did not like what Jesus was doing. They didn't like that this guy was healed. They saw it as a nuisance. They asked Jesus to go. They ran him off like a dog. They said, please leave. Please go. We don't see uh, your purpose here. We don't, we don't want to see it and go. Okay, and now he comes into a situation, the Bible tells us, that he's come back across the sea there, and he, he's, he's landed on the shore about to, and there's people actually waiting and expecting him. It says, it says Jesus returned, a crowd actually welcomed him. There's people there that are desperate, that are in need for Jesus. They've heard of what he's done. They've, they've heard of people talk about the miracles and saying, I need that in my life. So I'm going to come on the shore here expecting him, expecting him. And, and so what we see today is a desperate dad. We're going to read about a desperate dad, a father of a girl. And, and no doubt he's pacing. This is probably a, a, a scenario he's never seen in his life. He's in a deep and dark place. And his daughter is dying. And he's waiting for Jesus to get ashore so that he can approach Jesus and ask him for the impossible. He's heard what's going, but people are expecting him. And we're going to press down on that in just a little bit about expecting him. And here's the first thing I want you to take with you. If you can write this down, if you can tweet it, if you can remember, that's fine. But put it on your heart. Is this, that God moves the most when we live a life of expectancy. That's when he, he moves the most. That's when he moves the fastest. Is when we expect him to, when we plan on it. Okay, that's just another word for faith. He asks us to have expectancy. Expect when I show up that something's going to happen. And that's what we got. So God moves the most when we live a life of expectancy. So watch this. The man, then a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. First of all, with Jairus, Jairus is a pretty important guy. He's somebody people probably kiss his tail, okay? He was known in the community. He had friends. And because he was a, a keeper of the synagogue, okay, he managed it. It was kind of like what we would call church. He would make sure the chairs are out and the lights are up and that God's word would be ready to be read, Okay, and people would be ceremonially clean when they came in. They did the rituals and the routines and, tr and the traditions. He would have made sure that a church service ran well. So he would have no doubt uh, attracted the attention of some pretty important people. Okay, he's very religious. 
he had the garb on, but he was very responsible for that, and that was his job. So when, when he went out, he couldn't just go out, okay? He would run into people he know. People know him. He knows people, okay? So he's, he's over the synagogue, okay? And here's what I've learned is our church, and I, I say this about once a month, and I mean it, is we ask God to bring us messy people. We feel like that's who we're to minister to. That's why he put us right where he did, okay? We love where we are. We're not so you're trying to find a building. No, heck no. If you bought us the Sears building across the street, okay, we'd move across the street, okay? That's our only goal at this point, right? Okay, but we know we're called to be here because we're called to be near messy people. And here's what we found as a church is we are attracting people that come on, on side conversations or by email, coming up and saying, you know what, for, for the longest time I, I've been, I feel distant from God. Don't get me wrong, I've been in church a lot and, and a lot recently, but I've ne I haven't felt his presence. I haven't viewed his word. I haven't viewed uh, uh, scripture in a way that I feel like Jesus lives his life. I'm starting to hear things and see things. And I've got to be honest with you, I even feel up to the point where I need to repent for this. I've heard this about four or five times in the last month, and about 20 times over the last six months, is people saying that, I feel like this is new to me. And what people, what we do is, man, we're seeing people, and we've got to adjust to that. Well, we weren't expecting this so much, but people are addicted to, to tradition or to religion, okay? And there's not a lot wrong with tradition until it, it kind of uh, takes precedence over Jesus. And, and that's what Jairus would have done. He would have made sure that all the routines and rituals were in place. And I often wonder, I can't prove this in Scripture, but man, a lot, a lot of the religious leaders of those times were so obsessed with those things, they would miss Jesus. And when Jesus came on the scene, okay, they would miss who he was. They would miss that out. And as a matter of fact, their mentality cramped their style so much that that mentality, that religious mentality is what put Jesus on the cross. Our sin. But they perpetuated that, okay? So uh, most of Jesus' obstacles, if, when you read about his life, was religion. Okay? So that's where we are. It says, uh, here's the next thing I want you to catch. Religion values reputation over relationships. Religious people, religion values reputation over relationships. Now that's exactly opposite of the way Jesus lived his life. For your sake and mine, and for all the low down dirty people that we've always thought were low down and dirty, Jesus risked his reputation for a relationship. They accused him, rightly so, of being a friend of sinners. He was so closely associated because he was willing to risk his reputation so that he could present hope and love and give us, off, offer us forgiveness for our sin, that he risked his reputation. And so, but what religion does is they're so worried about their reputation that they miss people, they miss relationships. But Jairus, I can't, I can't think that he maybe wasn't a part of that crowd at some point. But what, what Jairus was realizing was, my situ religion is not helping my situation. There's no routine or ritual that can. It's a relationship. I need a relationship with Jesus. I need to come a step away from this, these rules and rituals, and I need to have a relationship with Jesus. I need to get in his presence. Sorry. Y'all forgive me. Okay. This is a huge step for Jairus, and I know it's a huge step for so many people that are coming here. It's like, man, we're in a gym. Where's the cross? Where's some pews? Okay? Where's that smell that comes with the church uh, instead of sweaty socks? And so this is a huge thing, and people are working through that. They're saying, man, I'm missing out. My family's missing out on some miracles in their life. They're, they're, they're missing out on some open doors because I'm more concerned about religion, rituals, in routines than I am a relationship. So that's where Jairus is. I wrote this down for myself. Extending grace to others is the surest way to show that you're, you understand it yourself. Listen, if you've been saved, if, if God has really made such a, a drastic change in your life because he's forgiven you of your sin and you've, you've actually repented, and man, your life is starting to change, you are quick to pass that out. You're not, you, you, you are looking for opportunities to, to demonstrate grace. Okay? That's how you can tell somebody that's, man, they're reading Scripture, they're understanding this, because when they're saved, they're looking for other people to be saved. And that's what Jairus is doing here. He's starting to realize, man, uh, I need Jesus. And so that, that same Scripture talks about just how many people are around. He's waiting on Jesus on the shore, and Jesus comes in. He's saying, man, my, my religion won't help me, uh, but I've heard that this man can. I need to get to him. And and where we see crowds, there's always crowds following Jesus, especially at this point. 
He's a rock star. He's, he, is, he is known. And people are flocking him. And we just read in Scripture, it says he's, the crowd's almost crushed him. And what a lot of commentators uh, are, are guessing is that, man, anywhere from five to 15,000 people at one time, and it's crushing him. Okay, Jesus is, is, is attracting that many people for, that, that need healing, that have situations maybe not unlike yours, that, man, that he's the only answer to that. And if we aren't amazed by grace, then it's a sign we completely misunderstand it. If, we're, if we aren't amazed by grace, it's a sign we completely misunderstand it. Okay? It should be when somebody raises a hand, man, I, I need Jesus in my life. We, we have a response time. Okay? We have uh, a lot of baptisms here. We've had a lot of people give their life to Christ. It, it, it should not create numbness in you. There should be something in you that says, man, lives are changed forever, and, and he needs this so bad. So, five to 15,000 people, and they're desperate. They're, they're coming after him, and he has his most valued thing. The Bible is sure to tell us that this is his only daughter. Jairus is in a jam. And this is his only daughter, the thing he values the most. Now, for him, it's his daughter. She's dying. She's actually going, he, he fears going to leave her. He is, he is fearing the worst. And for some of you, it's not your daughter dying, man. It's your, your marriage. It is one word away or one step away from it ending. Financially, your back may be just about broken. You don't know how you're going to make it. You don't know how the bills are going to get paid. Your kid's one step away from just turning crazy on you. And you feel like you've lost your grip on that. And, man, you're desperate. You don't know what to do. You didn't plan for this. This didn't come with the manual, you know, raising kids. And things are just maybe outside of your grip. And Jairus is feeling that pull. He's feeling that, man, I, I, I don't know where else to go. I don't know what else to do. So the Bible says that, that Jairus invited him to his house. I'll read the scripture again since I've talked so much. Then a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue. Now you know what that means and the implications of that. He's got a lot to lose. He's, he's going to commit political suicide here, okay? His, his religious leaders that, that can't stand Jesus, he's probably going to be ostracized for her, but he's saying it's worth it because sometimes you've got to take a step towards Jesus and walk away from something for, for him to do something in your life, okay? He's risking isolation, in public humili humiliation. And it goes on to say that he came and fell at Jesus' feet. Notice his posture with that. Notice that, look, he is, he is abandoning his reputation. And, what, and, and there's so many men I'm talking to now. I'm intentionally trying to have the conversation. Man, your wives want to lead you so, they want you to lead them so bad. They're hoping that you'll start a, a conversation about how Jesus can, can infiltrate your family. Okay? And that you can be the parent that God called you to be. And he's abandoning that. He's saying, man, if I want this, I'm going to have to abandon my reputation. I'm going to have to abandon maybe my job. But I need this so bad in my life. And it caused him to consider taking a drastic step. And it says this in verse 42, because his only daughter, and I don't know how many of you got a daughter. I've got two. Even if it's a son, man, if it's a kid, it's something you value more than just about anything in the world. Is that and so this is a girl of almost 12 she was dying and Jesus was on his way and the crowds almost crushed him so here's what I love about this is this being such a huge step that but that he he invites Jesus to his house he invites Jesus to his house. It's very very important for us to know but before I say that our next point is Jesus wants our request to be bold he wants whatever it is that we need and remember that whatever's important to you is important to God. If it concerns you, it concerns Him. He wants you to bring it to Him so bad. And that what people don't realize, even ones that are already Christ followers, is that when you bring something, if, if, when you fail to bring something to God, it's, it's dishonorable to God. He wants, to be, he wants you to be totally dependent on Him. And He says in His Word that, man, the reason some stuff hadn't happened in your life because you never asked me. It's not that He didn't know it was an issue, but you didn't present it to Him. And he wants us to be bold. Jesus wants to be bold in our requests. And again, his posture shows some of that boldness. Willing to, 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 to do something like that in front of so many people. Demonstrated boldness. It's so important to meet Jesus. He wants us to be desperate. He wants to approach, approach him in, from the angle of desperation. He wants the little things and the big things. And this is what's on his plate. Now, I love that, that when... when he, the Bible, the scripture is very clear, and it would have told people back in those days about him inviting to his house, come to my house. 
There's something about inviting somebody to your house. It's an intimate invitation. It means I want to share life with you. I want you to be a part of my life. I want you to see my, my I want to be a good host to you. I want you to enjoy things that are mine. I want to share. I want, I want our lives to, to, to deepen. And that's what he does. He invites him to his house. Jairus went himself. He went himself to Jesus. He, Jairus was so important, he could have sent an assistant. He could have sent a friend. He could have sent anybody. But he said, I've got to do this for me. And some of y'all are in that same boat. Okay, you're waiting on, on, on Jesus to make a move. He just wants you to, to present your request boldly. He wants you to approach him with it. He wants you to open the door for him to come in. He wants you to invite him into the most intimate parts of your life. Y'all with me? Y'all with me? You're asleep. All right, good. All right. Now, Jesus got interrupted, okay? He got uh, interrupted, uh, and Jairus got interrupted. And we said last week, I'm not going to say a whole lot, but there was a lady with a, 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 a bleeding problem. She hemorrhaged. She was bleeding all the time, if you know what I mean. And that was considered unclean, and she felt isolated. Uh, she felt alone. She was uh, um, just kind of set, set on the outside of the city limits. She had to spend a lot of time away from people. And this lady was so desperate, she felt if she could touch, just touch his garment, if she could just get in his presence, that she could touch it and she would be healed. And she was. But she had to be bold in her faith. And, and, and some of the, the, the application points said last time, to make the right choices, she had to listen to the right voices. Okay? She could have got stoned to death. People could have told her to back away that maybe recognize her. Don't go there. You're too unclean for Jesus. You're going to make all these people unclean that you're trying to touch. And she didn't listen to the, to the voices in her life, those negative voices. And she knew there was power in his presence. She knew if I could get to Jesus. Some of you are like, man, if I just, I'm just going to try church. I'm just going to go see what happens. That's awesome. That's awesome. You're trying to get near his, in, in his presence. Because where Jesus is, things happen. And then Jesus doesn't just save you from something. He saves you for something. He doesn't just want to help you with your situation. You're in. He just want to help you financially with your relationships or these lifestyles and habits that we have. He wants to do that for you. Okay? He wants to heal you from that, but he wants to, for, to, to save you and to restore you for something. He wants you to make a difference in people's lives. He wants you to be a vessel for him, to work through the lives of others. And the last thing was she was strengthened through her struggle. No doubt that when she, after living in isolation all those years and, and with that weight, there's no doubt that she appreciated so much more than what was in front of her. But that whole scenario interrupted this. And there's no doubt that Jairus was frustrated and concerned that his daughter would die. He was put out. There's no doubt about it. So we pick up there. And in verse 49 it says, While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus near the, near the synagogue ruler. Somebody had ran that way. They knew Jairus was approaching Jesus. Jairus was saying, I think I can get Jesus to come. Something will happen. But somebody came from his house and it said this, Your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Your daughter's dead. And what they were saying with this is there is no hope. There is no hope. She's dead. Don't waste your time. And I love this part about Jairus, and this is where some of you are. I love this, that even when he was told she was dead, he still took, took, Jairus, took Jesus to his house, took him anyway. I know it sounds bad. I know it looks bad. People are saying it's bad, but I'm taking Jesus anyway. And he took Jesus. And here's what I want you to notice. This is my favorite part of the day. Here's what I want you to hear. Jesus' words remove weight. That encompasses everything we've been talking about for the past four weeks. Jesus' words remove weight. Jesus' words remove weight. I was talking to my wife, and I mean, I'm so thankful I can talk with her about spiritual things. I, I remember a time that that wasn't the case because of me. And it made it awkward. But we were talking about just Jesus' name. Just when you start to talk about Jesus, doesn't it change a, uh, an environment? Sometimes it makes it tense, but sometimes it lightens it. You bring hope to people when they hear your name. They're just in the band. They're not mad at me. But look, when, when you bring, you, what you actually do when you read God's Word and you look for situations that God can plug you into and opportunities and open doors, when you bring that in, you bring people, you bring Jesus into their presence, to their circumstances, okay? So that God can start working. Maybe they won't walk through the door. Maybe they might not come to a church, especially one like this, right? But man, 
but you take Jesus to them. Because that's why there's, there's all kind of worship songs that talks about his name. His name is high, it's great, it's wonderful. His name, his name, it carries a lot of weight. When people hear Jesus, man, it's a game changer. And that's what we do is Jesus' words remove weight, especially when they came out of his mouth. And that's what we're going to look at. Because I see, I see dramatic change in people. They're hearing his word taught either here, hey, life groups, that's where it happens. They hear that. And man, I see people now, they're, they're walking away from relationships, okay? They're redefining their relationships because God's called them to. God, through his word, has told them to do that. So here we go. Hearing this, hearing this, hearing that, hey, don't even bother. Tell Jesus to go on about his business. You come on home. We got, we got a funeral to do. It's hopeless. It's the end. Forget about it. Hearing this, this is what Jesus says. Hear that? Here's what Jesus said because Jesus' words remove weight. Here's what his word said to Jairus. Don't be afraid. Just believe. And she will be healed. His words lifted a weight off of Jairus. His words lifted a weight. He's saying, look. He's saying, don't be afraid. He's saying, be expectant. Remember we just said that? Be expectant. You can't follow Christ. Some of you are, are, are saying, man, should I do this? And some of you recently have. You can't follow Christ without an expectant heart. You can't do it. Okay? Doors will close. Jesus says in his word, he said, hey, I, I, you know, in Mark chapter 6, right after he does all this stuff, he goes to another town. He goes to another town, man, with the same intention. Somebody's going to want me and need me to do something. They're going to be desperate, and I want to respond so much to them. And he goes to his own hometown. And Jesus, out of his mouth, said, man, I can't do a miracle here. I can't do it because, look, they don't have any faith. They don't have any expectancy. So less miracles were performed, okay? That's what happens. He wants us to have an expectant heart, not just for your sake, but your family and our church and this community. It's dry and broken. They need for you to have an expectant heart. So it says, when he arrived at the house, Jesus made the trek with him. Isn't that awesome that he went with him, that he went into a situation with Jairus, an awkward situation? His daughter's already dead. It's an awkward walk. And he said when he arrived to the house of Jairus, he did not, and Jesus did not, let anyone go with him except Peter, John, uh, James, and the child's father and mother. That's all he wanted in there. He walked into the situation. He said, look, some of these people are going to have to go because this is what happened. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead but asleep. They laughed at him knowing that she was dead. Here's something you've got to understand. They would have already understood this back in those days in their culture. But when you died, when you had somebody that passed away in your family, you, would have a, you wouldn't wait three days to put it in the paper and make sure you picked out caskets and all that stuff. They got a plot. Just like that. They're ready to put you in the ground. Because listen, death is final. Death is final. And they put the exclamation point on that. And here's what they do. It was Jewish law that you had mourners at your funeral. The minimum was two mourners and one flute. I don't know if it was this kind of flute, but it was music playing, a flute. And that was the law. It doesn't matter how poor you are. You better find a way. You better cash in your favors or whatever you're going to spend the money on paying people to mourn that death. Okay? And here's what they would do. They would, the Bible, the, the real word in the Bible, when you, when you research it, sounds more like howling. Okay? Like a wolf howling. Oh, oh, moaning and groaning. People pulling out their hair, showing outward signs of grief. Okay? And listen, Jairus, remember we said he was the man. That's important here. That means there was a lot of people there. Okay? They probably trying to kiss his tail again or maybe... Uh, doing him a favor, or he had money. If he was in a religion, not like now, if a religious uh, uh, situation like that, he, he would have spent the money on, okay, just go get it right now, I'll pay him this much. Listen, people benefited from this loss. These people surrounding here, they are like vultures. I can get paid today, man. I got a little part time gig, something like that. I can get over there and get a little bit of cash. People did this for them. They may not even know who died. All they know is they were paid, they're going to get money to wail and mourn this, this wedding. I mean this funeral, sorry. Same thing? No. And so Jesus walks up on the scene and he sees these people. And what they're really saying is, no hope. There's no hope. It's final. It's dead. There's no hope. And Jesus can't stand that. 
You know he doesn't. I feel like he's kind of irritated here. He walks up on him. Let me see if he was irritated. Stop wailing. Yeah, that sounds irritated. He walks up and hears these people in his ear telling him there is no hope. There's no hope. Death is final. It's over. And, and Jesus walks up on the scene and said, get out of here. Stop it. She's not dead. Stop. I'm here. No situation is dead when I show up. Not your marriage, not your financial situation, not the things that are going in your life that you probably got secret. None of that's dead. When I show up on the scene, because look, I bring dead things to life. That's what he does. And here's what I think. This is what Jesus is telling me in this situation is, you know, Richard, do you have these kind of people in your life that kind of look forward to, to telling you the bad news or telling you reality? Who's got your ear in your life? Look, and what I'm not about to say is, look, when people are messy, we are called to be in there, We're called to meet their need. We're called to get involved in their life. But those other people that are chirping in your ear, that might benefit from you not putting all your faith in what God will do in your life and what your next steps might be. Listen, he did it. He removed those people. He removed those voices in Jairus' life that was telling him there was no hope. But he brought in, I love this part, he brought in these people, James, John, and Peter, and he said, look, these are people that are used to seeing miracles, they're used to seeing me move. Listen, let's surround ourselves with some of those people in these circumstances that will speak truth in your life and that will, will vouch for the fact that Jesus can do amazing things. So I want you to look into your life, look at the people that's got your ear. And say, do they need that kind of access to my life? You probably what you're going to find is people that benefit from you not knowing Jesus and following Jesus. Maybe that's a relationship. Maybe it's a boyfriend or a, a girlfriend that hope, just secretly hopes you don't take this step in giving Jesus your life because they somehow benefit when you don't. Does that make sense? I believe Jesus wants to evaluate those people in our life. Who's got access to you? I love this. I love it. I wish you'd stand right here. This is where I want you to stand. Try not to go use the bathroom or nothing right now. I love this part. Because Jesus, because Jairus was expectant, because he was bold in his request to Jesus, and because he didn't listen to the negative voices in his life, he was able to see a miracle happen. He got to see the impossible happen. He got to do it. And here's, here's Jesus in his words again. They lift weight, don't they? They remove weights. Verse 54 says this, But he took her by the hand, this dead girl, he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. My child, get up. His words lifted a weight off of Jairus. Now lifting off of these girls, this, this girl and all the people in this room and the parents. He said, my child, get up. And here's what I want. I hope you'll catch this. I hope you'll catch this Revolution Church and in Scripture. Is this last point. Is Jesus did not come to make bad people good, but to make dead people live. A lot of people get that mixed up. Yeah, that's pretty good. We're trying to remove, look, we don't want bad people good. We don't want people just coming in and you be a good person, man. If we view it from that point of view, it should shock you. It should amaze you. It should cause you to celebrate, not mourn. It, could, it, it should cause you to not be apathetic, but to be excited that Jesus came so that dead people could live, so they could have life, so that they could live, okay? Death is not final. When it comes to Jesus, your marriages, your situations are not final. I love it. Her spirit returned at once and she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. I love that. I love that Jesus is a fan of food because I'm a fan of food. Yeah, that's right. Her parents were astonished. Listen, here's what I think. I think Jesus said, give her food. One, she's probably hadn't eaten in a while. She's dead, right? So she's probably hungry. But another one is, look, that's a sign. When people are eating, you can tell they're getting better. If you go visit someone in the hospital and they start eating, you know, okay, it's getting better now. That's, that's on the upswing here. This is something. Okay? And Jesus says, uh, Jesus told them. There's his, there's his word again. There's his word. Told them and they responded, give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished. The Bible says they were astonished. They were amazed. They weren't like, okay, that's a cool church service. 
uh, awesome worship pastor. Man, he's the man. That band is awesome. That's good. They were astonished. They couldn't believe what they had seen. And it was because Jairus fought through, listen, he fought through religion. He, he, he knew he had to, that Jesus had to be this solution. He said, i got to look at the people in my life, man. They're, they're telling me this is over. They came to me and said, hey, she's dead. And when he got there, they're mourning. It's like they almost wanted it to fail or, or wanted her to be dead. And Jesus says, nothing's dead. If I can get a hold of it, have hope, have belief, live expectantly. And that's the message for us today. And we can pull a million things out of there, but listen. What today is about is a, it's a gospel message. Listen, we are dead. Our sins cause us to be dead and distant from God. Some of us are just zombies, for lack of a better word. We are, we are dead. We're walking around, but we're dead. And Jesus says, I have life for you. It is so free. It is a gift. You can't do anything to earn it. And therefore, you can't do anything to lose it. Man, but if you'll surrender your life to me, I will make you brand new. I'll make you clean. You'll get a fresh start. I'll forget about your sins. I will forgive you for it. And because you're so amazed that he's willing to... to bring you from death to life that you man you, you're going to repent you're going to look for opportunities to repent your life is going to present and, and God's just going to propel you forward and move you forward and, and man he's going to just open these doors we've been talking about and your relationships and marriage and whatever the scenario is for you listen there was a, there, there, there's always a step there's a step the girl had to get up there's a step so here's what I'm going to do if you, if you just give everybody the privacy Dead, right? just by closing your eyes I can still see your eyes you can bow your head listen that hope is available for you it is yours to receive he offers it freely he doesn't force it on you man he tries his best to orchestrate it in your life he doesn't just want you to buy into religion he wants a relationship with you and he's going to equip you he's going to comfort you he even sent what's called a Holy Spirit to, to, to just guide you so that you, it will help you with these things in your life. I just want to pray for you. If you need that forgiveness, I've never done that before. Man, I came real close. Thank you. You already see your hand. Who else? Thank you. Thank you. I see it. Thank you. Anybody else? Pray this with me. Father God, I... Uh, I'm not sure about this whole church thing. I don't, I don't fully understand you, God, but I feel a pull. I feel a pull, Lord, to follow you, to abandon things in my life, to repent, to walk away from things, God, and follow you. God, I accept your gift of life. God, I understand that you died on the cross as the perfect sacrifice so that I could have life. Your death gave me life, God, but you, you raised on the third day, God, and made it possible for us to have a relationship with you and have an impact on earth, God. Thank you. I don't deserve it, Lord, but you give it to me and I take it. I thank you for that forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, you got a hand clap for people that that should be celebrated. That's when you should be astonished. I can't believe this happened. This happened in a gym. This happened on this side of town. This happened with this, this dude that's uh, barely on stage. Even better than that, all the people that have taken on responsibility as volunteers here, man, just that's your reward. You get to witness people giving their life to Christ. What an awesome thing. We should be astonished. Okay? Listen, there's the rest of you, though. There's, in, including me. Man, life just gets hard, doesn't it? It's, uh, you're not sure what to do. You're not sure where to go. And the weight is very heavy. And maybe you're already following Christ, but... And you need to be renewed. You need more energy. It can only come from asking Jesus for it. If you close your eyes real quick, would you just raise your hand? If you need that, yeah, me too. It should be all of you, but that's okay if it's not. Some of you probably didn't wear deodorant. Like, I can't raise my hand too far, Rich, because I forgot my deodorant. That's okay. I'm going to assume you have that weight in your life. I just want to pray for you. Let's pray. Father, lift the weight, God. Remove it from our lives, God. And we know, Lord, there's steps that we take, Lord, to enable you to do that, that they invite you to do that, God, and that's steps of obedience. God, and we'd ask that you put that opportunity to be obedient in front of us, Lord, and we will respond to it. 
we will take that step, God. Thank you, Lord, for your word that gives us the courage, Lord, and the know-how of what to do next. God, we just thank you for saving lives. Some marriages were saved today and on a, on a path to being saved, God, because they took that first step of being saved and inviting you into their life, into their home, into their most intimate areas of their life, God. And you're going to do amazing things because of that. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you. Amen. Okay, listen, here's your opportunity. Sally's going to talk a little bit with you about baptism. I know that's your next step. Jesus says it's your next step. You can sign up for it at the connection table. She's going to talk with you about that. God is moving this church forward rapidly. Rapidly. Okay, we're taking those bold steps we talked about a couple months ago. They're unfolding. This is a great time. If you're like, man, I like to see things grow. I like things that aren't normal because I'm not normal. I'm weird, and I am too. And man, I, I, I want to be a part of this. How do I get plugged in? Sally's going to talk with you about that. But man, what a time to, to be obedient to God. What, a, what an opportunity to be a part of something just awesome. Okay? So, but this is your time. It's not put the cart before the horse. This is a time of worship. God created us to worship. Not to be apathetic, but to worship. There'll be words on the screen. It's dark in here. Man, go all out. Just go all out. Put something on Jesus' lap. Ask Him for something. Beg Him for something. He wants us to be bold. He wants us to approach Him with things. He said in His Word. Things happen when that happens. There's your opportunity. I'm going to be over here. I'm not magical, but I'll be over here if you need me. But there will be people over here against this wall, men and women, that are, are, we are anxious to pray for you and just pray something that's going on in, in your life, okay? But listen, let the Word soak in and worship, okay? One more time, Jesus, thank you for saving lives and changing lives, Lord. Thank you for the horizon ahead, God. Thank you for equipping us, God. Thank you for resourcing us. God, just thank you, Lord, that you, you remove weight. We just thank you for this series, God, where people responded, Lord. They, they responded to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Clap one more time. Yeah.